Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. For those of you who don't know, my name is Tyler Kaufman, and it's my privilege to be the pastor here at Leewood United Methodist Church. If you are joining us online, we're glad that you're with us, whether you're joining now or later, and we trust that God will speak to your spirit this morning. Uh, I have a couple of different just family housekeeping announcements for you this morning. First of all is that choir and bell rehearsals begin on Wednesday. And so, yay, exactly. <laughs> Excited to, to get to, to hear those uh, in the midst of the regular year. Uh, again, handbell choir starts at 6.15 and then choir is at 7.15. Uh, there is another opportunity to serve at the hub coming up. There's going to be a district-wide event where people from churches all across the Kansas City area will meet at the hub, and that's September 24th. You can sign up on the Google Drive. There's a link in the weekly announcements that come to the email, and you can also uh, call the office or, I believe, email um, myself or, well, you can email me. That's fine. <laughs> And then, uh, the, of course, the Tango Swing and Bling, uh, that is next Sunday at 3 o'clock. So we're going to have Fresh Start Sunday uh, that morning, and we will have a blessing, a back-to-school blessing for students and educators and staff of schools. And so invite you to come, whether whatever category you fit in, and invite uh, friends or family that fit in those categories and want to just pray a blessing on their safety and well-being and uh, opportunities that will come to them this school year. And then after service, we'll have some special treats. I'm getting some local artisan uh, coffee and pastries, so I hope that you'll invite friends and come and just enjoy some good food, and we'll have some games out on the front lawn before uh, we kick off back to Sunday school as well. And I think that's all the announcements. Are there any others that I've missed this morning? Any others that anyone has? Well, then let's begin worship. Will you join me in an attitude of prayer? Gracious Lord, we thank you for meeting us in this place in a special and unique way speaking to our hearts in the midst of our busy lives, helping us to find peace and to know your peace. Continue to pour into us and help us to set aside times when we can recognize better your presence in our midst. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Would you stand in body and spirit as for our call to worship this morning? In Jesus Christ, there is a new creation. This newness is from God, who has reconciled us through Jesus Christ. Everything has become new. And let us sing together our opening song of praise. This is a day of new beginnings. It is our joy this morning to welcome new additions to this church family. So at this time, I'd like to ask the Bruces to Rob, Becky, Cora, and Timothy to come forward. And I'm also going to ask Melanie to come back up for a moment. If you all want to just join me up here, I will move this out of our way. That's perfect. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy universal church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. And all of this is God's gift offered to us without price. This is true regardless of where our baptism takes place. As we journey with God through life, we travel to new places and meet new people, join a different church family, and through it all, God works through the power of the Holy Spirit. So today we have the blessing of witnessing new members formally transferring from their previous church to this church. And I want to share a little bit about the Bruces. I know many of you already know them. Uh, they have been attending worship here regularly and, and connecting over, for over a month now. And this morning, Rob and Becky are making their membership official with a publicly stated commitment. And we welcome Cora and Timothy as well to this church family. I wanted to ask Melanie just to share a little bit about them with you. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'm thrilled that, that they, they are here today. And... Um, I feel like I'm really far away. You're welcome to walk over to <laughs> um, We have, our family has known the Bruces for probably at least 10 years um, uh, because Cora and Caleb were in the same class at, Park, in, at Parkwood together. And so they grew up, you know, in, in preschool together and we would see each other at 
gingerbread and, you know, end of the year festivities and trunk or treats and all those things. And we got to know each other a little bit through, through that. And Cora and Caleb are now eighth graders um, at Indian Woods Middle School. And Timmy is a third grader at, I forgot, Brookwood, right? And so um, time has passed. <laughs> and we are glad, glad that they are here. And I'm especially excited that um, Becky and Rob are um, probably going to play in the handbell choir with us. And Rob's thinking about singing in the choir. <laughs> so um, we're just really, really glad to be in in ministry with them and to be in community with them now. And I hope that you'll get a chance to meet them and welcome them as well. Thank you, Melanie. You can tell by the applause that you're like, definitely welcoming the family here. That's wonderful. So to begin, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you to respond to the historic questions of commitment to God's work in the world. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church, with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. Church family, do you, as Christ's body, the church, Reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. If so, say, we do. Let us all join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Now, Rob and Becky, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? So say, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend all of these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And please join me in the prayer for a blessing and response to welcome them to the congregation. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ, we renew our covenant to faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus. Now, I invite you all to just uh, join me in prayer, and we're going to pray a little blessing over you. Would you all join me in an attitude of prayer? And I invite you to uh, lift a hands towards them if you want during this blessing, or simply bow your head and send a blessing their way. God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish your power by the Holy Spirit within this church and within these people who now gather to join with us as a church family. That in you we may live in grace and peace. Amen. Thank you all. And will you join me in welcoming them with another round of applause? I'm so glad to have you all here. Thank you. everybody out here too. So uh, 
The children's message is a story many of you have heard before, but we're going to do it a little bit differently, and I need all of your help to make all of them help. Are you with me? Excellent. So today's story is from Luke, and it's the story of the prodigal son. And someone with eagle eyes said, is that why the Bible is open to that? And I thought, wow, someone's paying attention. Two people, at least, are paying attention. So yes, the Bible is open to that story. But we're going to present it in a little different way. And we do need your help, if you can help us with this. And um, our leaders for the help, for the actions that we hope you will do with us, are right up here. So guys, let's go ahead and stand up. And I'll remind you that this is a story of two brothers. And you can kind of, if you want to spread out a little so everybody can see, you know, spread out a little bit. And if you're confused as to what to do, you can always look at me. All right? I don't mind being silly. So remember, this is a story of a dad and his two sons. And the dad was a farmer, and he was pretty wealthy. He did pretty well for himself. And we're going to pretend with our actions to be the two sons. OK, are you ready? The first thing we're going to do is dig. And we expect you guys to do it with us. OK? There once was a farmer who had two sons. They all worked on the farm together. Are they digging? Do you see them digging? Yeah, they're digging. OK. But one day, the younger son was fed up. He threw down his spade and stomped up to his dad. He said, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. Give me my share of your money now. No, I don't really like the son right now. But his dad handed over the money. The boy jumped for joy. And he shouted, how do I do this, Corbin? Money, money, money. And he set out for a long journey from home. He got to a great city in a foreign land. And when he was there, he went on a wild shopping spree. He bought clothes. Go see those new, oh, nice shirt. Yeah, very nice. Oh, oh, so nice, looking good. And <laughs> very nice. He had a lot to eat. And he had a lot to drink. Until his money ran out. And all his friends left him. <laughs> the only job he could find was one cleaning up after pigs. P U. And he had nothing to eat. So hungry. And he worked with the pigs and the slop. Maybe he ate the slop. Do you think he ate the slop? Until one day he came to his senses. Sam. <laughs> You're a wise man, Sam. And wondered how did he get in such a mess? I don't know. I don't know. Oh. But then he had an idea. He wondered if he would go home to his father, maybe his dad would let him work for him again. And it might be better than taking care of the pigs and eating slop. So he set off on his feet for the very long journey home. But do you know what his dad was doing? His dad was looking for him. His dad was waiting for him, and when he saw his son from so far out, his dad ran to him. He threw down his spade, and he ran as fast as he could. And the son fell down, let's carefully fall down, to his knees, because he was so, so sorry. And the son opened his mouth to say he was sorry, but before he could even say he was sorry, do you know what his dad did? He grabbed him in the biggest smoosh of a hug you can imagine. So his son is just like, let's see them look like that. And what the dad said was, everybody, come, come, get him some clean clothes. Get him shoes. He doesn't have any shoes. Get him food. Get him something to drink. Tell everyone we're going to have the biggest party ever. My son was dead, but he's alive. He 
was lost and now he is found. And everybody began to party! And they ate and they drank and they were so happy! Except for one person. How many sons were there? Two. One went away. What did the other one do? He's, he stayed and he kept working. So the older son was still digging. And when he heard what was going on, he was furious. Give me your best mad face. And he stamped his foot. And he stayed outside sulking. Do you know what sulking means? Like, poor me. Yeah, yeah, you know sulk. Uh-huh. Until his dad came out to see what the matter was. The son said, Dad, it is not fair. I've worked for you this whole time. He gets the party. It is not fair. But his dad said, Son, you're always with me, and everything that I have is actually yours. We had to have this party because your brother was dead and now he's alive. Theo's partying away. He was lost and now he's found. And because of that, everybody said, hip hip hooray! <laughs> Wonderful! Okay, thank you guys. Thank you all. Okay, let's have a seat. You think so? I, well, you know, that's not a bad choice because that was a lot of grace the dad showed the, the son. So when I think about the story, Pastor Tyler, I hope, will explain this to us much better. Um, I often think of who I would be in the story. Sometimes I might be that one son that asks for something and does something I shouldn't. Do you guys ever do that? And then you have to go to your parents or somebody else and say, I'm sorry. Has that ever happened to you guys? Yeah. yeah. How do you feel before you say you're sorry? Sad and like guilty and all worried and anxious and like your tummy is all in a big knot. How do you feel after you say you're sorry? Better because you don't get as much <laughs> Better because you don't get in as much trouble if you talk about it and say you're sorry. That's true. It is important to say that. Now, is anybody here in school now? Everybody. Do you ever feel like maybe the older brother when you're doing the right thing and maybe somebody else isn't? And how does that feel? A little frustrating, isn't it? because it kind of feels like everybody should be treated the same, but different people make different choices, and sometimes it's hard to show grace and forgiveness. And once you get a little older, sometimes you may feel like the dad in the story, and then you'll understand how that dad felt. And when we think about the story, we usually say, you know, the dad in the story is who? Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Jesus and it's God who will always forgive us if we ask. Now, do you think that means that we can do anything we want that's wrong? No. no. <laughs> but if we do and we mean it and we ask forgiveness, what, what will Jesus always give us? He will. But I think there's another step there. If you guys do something wrong and you talk to your parents, you know, sometimes there are consequences, right? <laughs> Life's so hard. Always consequences. But we also expect you to learn and not do the same thing again. Do you think that that one son would have done the same thing again? I think that's what God expects of us, too. If we make a mistake, he will forgive us, but he expects us to try to do the right thing the next time. And if we see someone who makes a bad choice and is struggling... He also expects us to be kind to them and to try to help them. And I think you guys can all do that in your lives to show them some grace. I love talking to the story beforehand with a few of the kids that were here early because your mind was blown. You were like, who would say that to their parent? That's terrible. So I think we're in the clear. We're not getting those questions, parents, hopefully. 
But um, we do need to remember how to, how to ask for forgiveness, how to not do the same wrong choices again, but also to help others that maybe make wrong choices. Could you guys pray with me? Okay. Dear God, I thank you for every single person in this room. And help us, because we're all learning. We're all learning to make good choices. When we don't make a good choice, forgive us, God, and help us to learn from that. And and help us to always be kind to those around us if they're struggling with hard choices, too. Thank you for your grace and your love. And help us all this week. Amen. All right. Go sit down. Thanks, guys. You were awesome. Would you stand with me as we sing together our hymn? your heads please God of steadfast love and mercy far too often things seem as they have always been old habits die hard difficult situations linger and failures from our past creep into our minds when these things happened remind us once again that in Jesus Christ the old has passed away and everything has become new speak to us again of your new creation Open our eyes to your presence in our lives and help us to claim the new life you offer, that we may be healed and made whole. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen.
God of abundance, mercy, and grace, we bring these offerings to you this day along with our skills and abilities, acknowledging that they are all gifts from you which we manage to your glory. Help us to do so. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading for today is Luke 15, 11 to 32. Um, feel free to add any actions you may have already uh, done today. Okay. Jesus said a certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country, and he began to be in need. 
he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food? But I'm starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch, fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting, because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant reply, replied, your brother has arrived and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in, but his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, look, I've served you all these years and I never disobeyed your instruction. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned, after gobbling, after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. It's touching, isn't it? Today we wrap up our sermon series in which we've been seeking scriptural wisdom for the road trip of life. And at the end of any good road trip comes one of my favorite feelings in the world, the peace of the welcome home. I hope you've experienced it yourself. Perhaps it takes place when you pull into the driveway Maybe as you climb into your own bed for the first time in weeks, or as a good friend or neighbor asks you with genuine interest, how was your trip? And then joyfully celebrates it with you. For me, the peace 
of the welcome home comes when I sit down in my favorite recliner, lean back, pull the lever, kick up my feet, and breathe a deep sigh of relief. Oh, it is good to be home. Now, if you haven't experienced those moments, then I pray that you've had the same feeling of the welcome home when you arrive at your destination and receive a good hug from a loved one, or you lay on the beach, or sit down to some of grandma's delicious home cooking. When I'm on a road trip, it's these wonderful moments that play in my heart and my mind and lure me to my destination. I want that feeling. Now, at first glance, it would seem that that is the opposite of what is being experienced by the prodigal younger son on his long journey home. He seems to have no peace as he rehearses what he'll say to his father on this miles-long journey traveling from the other side of the Sea of Galilee where the Gentiles live back to his home amongst his own Jewish people. And it's understandable. I mean, he didn't exactly leave on good terms. As you saw during the children's sermon, we read that the younger son went to his father and said, Father, give me a share of property. Give me a share of property, the one that is coming to me. This young man basically tells his dad, hey, old man, why don't you have an estate sale? Why, you're still alive. I want my inheritance. I'm not waiting around for you to die so that I can enjoy my life. I want my stuff. I want what's coming to me. Now, those of you who have adult children, can you even imagine this thing? I pray that you haven't experienced it. I mean, the very idea just breaks my heart. And my son's not even six yet. The idea of him just coming up to me and saying, hey, dad, I want you to go sell your stuff and give me whatever's going to be mine when you're gone. Or as some have put it, this young man is saying, I'd be better off if you were dead. Look, this relationship, it's broken. And according to historian Ken Bailey, it would have been culturally appropriate at this moment for the father to raise his left hand and backhand his son across the face and then drive him out of the house. What's worse than asking for his inheritance early? This young man abandoned not only his family, but his entire culture altogether. In the first century, your people group is your safety net. And if you were to abandon it, well, there were consequences. And usually there were rituals to show that the community was in turn cutting you off. There is no coming home. Now, if for some reason the son were to decide that he needed to come back home, he would have been met by a group of elder men at the city limits where they would have performed the kezazah. According to Bailey, what basically happens in this kezazah ritual is this group of elders take this large clay pot to the city limits to meet the offender and they smash it at his feet. They smash it at the feet of the one who abandoned them in order to represent the brokenness of the relationship. Now in the first century Middle East, this pot is a symbol of livelihood and access to essential resources because it is what would have been used to carry food and perhaps gather water from the community well. So they are saying, you have no access to community resources. You are cut off. While this whole event is taking place, Bailey says the father would have been staying at home so he wouldn't have had to witness the shame and have his heart broken right in front of him. You see, for a father of the time, his sons are his legacy. And to abandon their father is to abandon participating in his legacy. Now, if this young man hasn't witnessed the Kezazah ceremony before, he would have at least known about it. And the ramifications that came with abandoning his family, his culture, going to live among an outside people and tending to pigs which made him not only physically unclean, I mean, have you been 
by one of those stockyards filled with pigs? I'm, I don't want anybody to lose their breakfast, so we're going to move on. But he is not only physically unclean, he's also ritually and spiritually unclean, according to Jewish law. And he has time to think of all of this while he is on his walk back home, traveling miles and miles. He has miles and miles of opportunity to turn around and not submit himself to this. Miles and miles to know there is no welcome home awaiting him. So why and how does he persist on his journey home? Well, perhaps it's due to the father's true legacy, not his money, which maybe we should note this guy has servants. There were basically two classes in his time period. There were people who had stuff and ate like we do, which were the rich, and then there were the peasants who served them. This guy has stature, he has things, he has stuff, he has a pretty hefty financial legacy to leave behind. But his character is his true legacy. We see it hinted at when Luke writes that the young man came to himself, or as another translation puts it, he came to his senses. And this phrase is only found one other place in the New Testament, which is in Acts, written by the same author. And it's describing this moment when Paul is rescued from prison by an angel, and he thinks the whole thing is a dream. And it says that he comes to his senses, and he realizes that this all really just happened. In other words, this young man is saying to himself, what the heck am I doing? And he snaps out of his dream that had turned into a nightmare, and he says, I, am no, I may no longer have rights to be my father's son, or even part of the community, but my father is a man of such love and grace and mercy that even the outsiders that serve as his servants are treated better than this situation I find myself in right now. My father is a man of character. And the young man resolves to beg and plead his way into becoming one of those servants. Now, you know the next part of the story. The son arrives at the edge of town, and this is the moment when the father should be back inside at his house, and a rather inhospitable or even hostile crowd should be meeting this wayward prodigal son for his kezazah. And what happens? There is no smashing of pots. Instead, there is radical grace, a radical welcome home. The word for saying that he uh, is kissed by his father is actually that he's smothered in kisses by his father. The way that you scoop up a baby or a toddler and smother them in kisses. It's this radical, almost indignant moment filled with grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and welcome. And it's truly radical, which we increasingly find out and continuously find out is the father's M.O. It's simply who he is. And as I mentioned earlier, when the son is asked for his inheritance, it would have been culturally okay for him to backhand his son, but he doesn't. With a huge dose of grace and mercy instead, he offers the son what he asked for. And he allows him to go learn some tough life lessons out in the real world, as they say. And here he does it again. He breaks cultural norms again. A middle-aged, Middle Eastern man in the first century who owns land and has servants is a man of great importance. And he's not supposed to be running anywhere. He has servants for that. He's not supposed to be showing his thighs either, which would have been impossible in this time period if he was running because he should have been wearing a dishdasha. Here, here's a man wearing kind of a, a modern form of a dishdasha, this long robe, which is fairly tight around the legs. So he would have had to pick up that long robe, exposing his calves and thighs in order to run. But here's the thing. 
he would have had to hike it up pretty far. Because actually, the Greek word that's used that says he's running is treko, which refers to an athletic race. This guy is running with all he's got, driven by his compassion for his son. He's determined to beat the rest of the community as if his heart and legs are in harmony, saying, there will be no kezaza today. My son will not be cut off. And when he arrives, the father then sets the narrative. My son is not a prodigal. My son was simply lost. And now he's found. And the father, with all of the grace and mercy and compassion and forgiveness he can muster, welcomes his son home. Oftentimes when we study this parable, and focus on the importance of repentance and humility, which are good things. Or we talk about not being self-righteous and excluding like the elder brother, which is also a good lesson. But we don't often spend much time on Jesus' invitation that comes at the end of the parable. You see, both of these brothers think the father's legacy is things. The younger wants them early so he can go and enjoy them with his youth. And the elder doesn't want them wasted after they become his. And we, we know that they're his because in verse 12, it, we're told that the father divided the estate amongst them. So everything left over is the elder sons. And so when this dad is having this celebration, all the elder son sees is his inheritance diminishing but this father's greatest treasure that he intends to leave to his sons, again, is not things. It is a merciful, grace-filled, compassionate, peace-building character. The type of character that cries with reckless abandon, welcome home. And Jesus ends this parable with a bit of a cliffhanger. The father is pleading with the son, and again, similar to the word that his father kissed him with the younger son, Pleading is this idea of pleading and pleading and pleading and pleading. It's this repetitive nature. He's re pleading with him to join the celebration, pleading with him to come in because it's, it's fitting to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and he is alive. He was lost and he's found. But we don't know whether or not the brother goes in. It's as if Jesus is saying to us, inviting us to answer for this elder son, inviting our response to the Heavenly Father, will you be his legacy? Will you inherit the character of God, the Father? Will you join the party, participate in the celebration, and be part of the welcome home? Every week, especially ones like Fresh Start Sunday next week, we have the opportunity to respond to such an invitation where we live into the character of God's legacy with authentic love and compassion that makes each other know we're home in the house of God. So how will we greet God's children who enter the house of the Lord? May our faces smile, our hearts be glad, our tone of voice be rich, and our words bear the love of the Heavenly Father who shouts for joy, welcome home. Amen. Lord of all joy, whose trust ever childlike no cares could destroy, be there on waking and give us, we pray, your bliss in our hearts, Lord, at the break. Thank you.
as you go forth from this place. May you take the peace that God has provided to your hearts and share it with the hearts of others. Amen. So I know there's quite a few people that want to 